hear you, sir. You may begin. If you could please turn your Bible with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I would like to start out by, uh, by just sharing a personal word from the heart. Um, I've been just humbled to be with you guys this semester uh, and to be just sitting under Dr. Neely. Uh, I'm a transfer student, so this is the first semester for me in Bible college, and I accidentally uh, got registered in this course. I wanted to take it, it just it didn't stop me because I didn't have the pure X, but it's really been a blessing to just learn from you guys. You guys are awesome, and you're so gifted, and I've just been so blessed uh, by hearing you all. And, um, and so I would like you to pray with me and for me, because um, I know I'm inadequate, and uh, I know my failures, and um, that I come short. So if you could just uh, please pray for me, um, that the Lord would just give me um, grace, a special measure of grace, um, in just these 20 minutes. Father, thank you that your grace is always sufficient for us. Thank you, God, that, uh, that you're alive. <laughs> thank you, Lord Jesus, that you live and intercede for us forevermore. Um, Lord God, that you just uh, enable us, Lord, to preach the word and to endure to the end. And uh, Lord, to uh, get to the celestial shore, God, after we fought the good fight and finished the race, God, mm -hmm. we just can't wait to behold your beauty, Lord, with unveiled faces. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. The day is far gone, and night is approaching. And the specks of silver and a silver of white decorate the Roman sky. And yet it's not so in the Mamertine prison in which this prisoner was held. Mm. It was a hole, and it was a dungeon underground approximately 12 feet in height. And the prisoners there were chained to shackles of iron fixed to the wall. And because of the length of the chain, they would have to sit day and night in their waist. And not only that, but rats are creeping in and out. And this place is just marked by filth and darkness and stench. Just no ordinary man can handle it. No ordinary man can handle this, the, the sight of it or the smell. And blood, crimson blood, is gushing down the face of this prisoner. And, and it's falling down on his body and it's eventually creating a puddle under his feet on that cold concrete and he's suffering and Paul's heart is beating slower and slower and his eyes are growing heavier and dimmer and his power is growing faint and lower and it seems that pain has inflicted every limb of his body mm. And somehow in God's providence, he was able to be unchained to pen down a letter to his son, Timothy. And so, with the little kindly lit oil lamp on the side, he starts to write. Mm -hmm. And he starts to shed a tear with every stroke of his pen. Not only because he's handing over this burdensome task to his son, Timothy, to preach the word, but he's also shedding tears of joy because he's about to depart from this earthly tent and he's about to put on the imperishable. And so, you are the Timothy that Paul is writing to. You are the preachers. Mm -hmm. He's about to depart from this life and he's writing to you and we have to take, um, just, we have to really pay attention to this because Paul is writing this to you. And I want to ask you one question. If you knew that your death was approaching in a couple of weeks, who would you write to and what would you write about? I submit to you that that reveals your heart. Whatever you write about, that's your heart. And whoever you write to, that is someone special. And so he writes to his son Timothy. That's the only one he has. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have children or a father or mother. He just has a son Timothy whom he has poured his life into for the past 15 years. Discipling, discipling. And now he's like, listen man, the ball is in your court, Timothy. Now you preach. And so, it reveals Paul's heart. And so we approach chapter 4 in 2 Timothy in this farewell discourse by Paul before he's about to be beheaded in a couple of weeks. And he's writing to his son Timothy. 
And we come to chapter 4. It starts with, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Preach the word. Here's Paul's priority, preaching the word. He's given his life, the past 30 years of his life has been devoted to preaching and proclaiming Christ and him crucified. And now he comes to Timothy and he says, listen, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And in verse 3 he says, the reason I'm giving you this charge, Timothy, is because there is coming a time when men will not endure sound teaching, but their ears will itch for some teaching and they will raise up people for them. Rob Bell, no hell. Come on, it's happening in our day, friends. And we know it. Prosperity. Come to Jesus and you'll have a nice car and 1.2 children and a nice wife and, and, you know, big house. And so he's writing this to you and to me because we are closer to the end than Timothy now. And people are itching for so many teachings now. But we must preach only the word. And we must be ready in season and out of season. And so he gives them this charge, and he gives them the reason for the charge. And then he says in verse 5, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. And so I would like to just tell you this, that Paul is not telling Timothy to do something that Paul hasn't done. Paul is saying this, listen, Timothy, I've preached the word, and I've endured suffering. Now the ball's in your court. Now you, my son, preach the word. Don't be ashamed. Preach it and endure suffering. And we're about to get a glimpse into into Paul, his past, his present, and his future. We come to now to the final will and testament of Paul, verses 6 to 8, in which he reflects on the present, recalls the past, and looks forward to the future. And so let's tackle this together. He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Here he's recalling the Old Testament sacrificial system in which it's mentioned in Numbers 15, in which they would offer a burnt offering, and then they would offer a, a, a drink offering. And it would be on the burnt offering, and it would make a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord, and even down to the last drop. And so Paul is saying here, listen, like that, I'm being poured out, literally, I'm being sacrificed. I'm being expended for the sake of the gospel. I mean, I have gone through it all. I've been tortured. I've been imprisoned. And now the time of my departure has come. I can see it. I can feel it. The Spirit of God testifies to me that I'm about to be beheaded. The time of my departure has come. This word departure... It has two meanings, and it has two illustrations. First, that of a tent coming down. And the second is that of a ship letting go of the anchor. And so Paul is saying here, listen man, this earthly tent is about to go down. And my soul is about to depart and be with the one I love. And he's saying, my ship's about to let go. And I'm about to go. And so brothers, I would like, and sisters, I would like to ask you, ask you, My accent gets in the way sometimes. I apologize. Uh, Give me 10 more years. (laughs) The saints. It wasn't just the Apostle Paul. It was all the saints. I mean, the Apostle John was was boiled in oil. Uh, Bartholomew was skinned alive. And James was speared to death by Indians. And St. Mark, he was tied to two horses. And he was dragged down the streets of Egypt until he bled to death. And I've walked down those same streets of Egypt day in and day out. And it wasn't until I got saved that I started to ask myself, have I counted the cost of following Christ? Have I counted the cost of preaching Christ? Because there is a cost to it. And so, when I get to the end of my life, I want to say this, Lord, I am being poured out as a drink offering. And it's about, the last drop is about to fall. I'm about to die for the sake of the gospel. I'm about to just give it all away, Lord. But you guys are graduating in 20 days. Some of you are going to go on to pastoral ministry, some to teaching ministry. And you're going to have to endure suffering also. If you preach Christ this day and age, you're going to suffer. And whether that means financially, whether that means marital strife, whether that means 
loss of the loved ones, whether that means the same-sex marriage laws that are about to be passed that could threaten churches and pastors to take away their tax-exempt status, or whether that means that you will have denominational conflicts because you're holding on to the truth and you're not going to compromise, you're going to have to endure suffering somehow. Yeah. And so I would like to encourage you, just as Paul does to Timothy, to just preach the word and to expend every fiber of your being for the sake of Christ because he is worth it. He goes on and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul loves that imagery. He loves that metaphor. He uses it in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wrath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. He is running the race, and he's given us this imagery of, listen, run, run, run. Moody graduates, run, run, run. You will have obstacles in ministry. You will have obstacles in life. And for preaching Christ, you will be accused and you'll be uh, humiliated. But, but press on. It's just like the Olympians in our day. They start training when they're four or five years old. And they don't do anything but train until they, they, they turn 22 and they run a nine-second race for a gold medal that they hang up. And that's it. It's over. And cannot we do the same for eternal matters? Mm -hmm. Cannot we buffet our bodies and endure what we have to endure for a crown that will not perish, a crown that will not just be hung up and then perish and melt away, but a crown that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to us on that day? But so far it seems like it's I, I, I. But Paul says... that the Lord Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. If we're going to suffer, if we're going to embrace the call to preach and endure suffering, it's not going to be on our own strength. Because if it was, we would all fail. We would all deny him. I watched a horrific video um, of this Tunisian young man. He's 22 years old, and he just got saved. And it was in Tunisia, and so Hezbollah took him out to the desert of Tunisia. And one of the imams was reading from the Quran about the, the, about the infidels. And he was reading how Allah hates the infidels. And meanwhile, this giant of a man was over this young man. And he had a knife in his hand. And he just held it up to his throat. And the young man had such peace. It was unbelievable. And I didn't want to watch the rest of the video. But he just started just slicing his throat until he cut off his neck. I'm sorry if that was graphic, but afterward, I watched the man as he was being sliced. He had such peace, such joy, and he didn't, like a shearer, that, like a sheep that was led before his shearers in silence. So was this man. And so if we're ever going to endure suffering, whether that's martyrdom over there in the Middle East, or whether that's everything that I described here in the States, the Holy Spirit will give us joy and peace and endure it. It's going to be not by our power by, or by our might, but by the power of His Spirit. And so, brothers, let's be encouraged by that. And He not only wishes to finish the race, but let me ask you a question. What race is He talking about? This is the man Paul that we're referring to. He was a man who has had far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times he received at the hands of the Jews thirty-nine lashes, and three times he was beaten with rods, and once he was stoned. Three times shipwrecked, and night and day adrift at sea. He was on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers and robbers, in danger from Jews and Gentiles, in danger in the city and in the wilderness, in danger at sea and from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from that, the daily anxiety of the churches. 
This is a man who has endured a lot. This is a man who is just saying at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight, man. I have ran through all the obstacles and I'm about to reach the finish line. And he's about to receive the award. He says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all who have loved his appearing. For the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross. And for the joy of obtaining the crown of righteousness from the righteous judge, Paul's enduring this race. He's fighting, he's fighting, he's fighting, he's battling all these obstacles that he's facing, all this suffering in light of standing before the Lord of glory one day. And brothers, I wish that is me. The moment I stand before the Bema Seat of Christ and I give an account, I'm not going to be ashamed that I spent less time studying or less time fellowshipping. I'm going to regret and I'm going to be ashamed that I didn't expend my life for this king. He is so worth it. He is so worth it. And he gives us strength too. He doesn't just send us out. He sends us out and he fills us with the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And so, for the crown that is set before us, Moody grads, brothers and sisters, let's endure whatever's going to come our way in preaching and proclaiming Christ and salvation that is found in no other name. There's an amazing story about, about Nero and about how when he started persecuting the Christians, he had a band of wrestlers and they were the best of the best, men of valor. They were men who couldn't be messed with. And so out of his old, whole army, he had just this band of wrestlers near him, always near him. And so their anthem was always, we the, we the wrestlers wrestling for thee, O emperor, to win thee the crown, and from thee the victor's crown. And so one day, war broke out, and the emperor Nero sent the wrestlers to fight this war. News got back to him, however, that some embraced the Christian faith. And so he wrote a decree to Vespasian, who was the general there. And he wrote to him and say, said this, If any among the wrestlers be found to have embraced the Christian faith, they must be killed. And so, as soon as Vespasian read it, he was troubled. And so he gathered all the wrestlers and he asked them, Which among you have embraced the Christian faith? Let him take two steps forward. And forty of the wrestlers of the mighty men took two steps forward. And Vespasian was just bewildered. That's crazy. That's a lot of good, powerful men. And so he said to them, listen, I don't want you to be killed. So I will give you till night to recant this faith. And so night came and Vespasian gathered the 40 wrestlers and he said, now, which among you still hold to the Christian faith? And all 40 took two steps forward. And so he said to them, listen, I don't want your blood to be among your peers. And so I'm going to have to ask you to do this. Take off your helmet and strip. And all 40 of you march into this frozen lake, because it was dead winter, and stay there till the elements eat you and kill you. And so right before they march out there, he said to them, listen, by the shore, I'm going to be sitting here by the fire. And if any one of you wants to come back and be warmed, please do. And so this patient is out by the fire and all 40 of them march to the middle of this frozen lake singing this anthem instead. 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And so this patient is out by the shore, by the fire, all night long. He's hearing their song grow dimmer and dimmer as they're dying. And then near dawn, he notices something coming his way. And it's one of the wrestlers, and he comes and he sits by the fire. And their song changes to 39 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And something came on this patient in that moment that he took off his helmet, he took off his garment, and he ran and he said, No, 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And like this patient, brothers, I don't want to be the one who walks out. I want to be this patient who completes the number. 
I want to endure suffering for the sake of the gospel. Whatever that may look like, it's different for all of us. But we're going to have to endure suffering if we're going to preach the truth of Christ in this depraved world. The message of the cross is foolishness. It's an offense and it's a stumbling block. And so we're not going to be treated um, good. <laughs> and so we must endure. And I'd like to read to you a hymn written by, written by Isaac Watts. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? We were not called to build empires for ourselves. We are called to advance a kingdom. Mm -hmm. And each one of you are called to preach the gospel and so preach it and endure suffering, whatever that may look like. But just know that you will stand before the Lord of glory and he will award to you the crown of righteousness. And brethren, may we all be found faithful. May we all be found to have endured in the end. Let's pray. Um, Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the cross by which the world has been crucified to us and us to the world, Lord. 